have made you a co-host. Yes, I can record now. And we are good to go. Thank you, Mary. Thank you for doing okay. that. And sorry, sorry for the confusion. <laughs> my bad. Here you go. I have to go back. Oh, my screen sharing is paused. Resume share. Okay. Okay, I'm hoping you can all see my slides now. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. My name is Mary Haskett. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Blink Identity. Um, I'm a very informal speaker, so if questions come up or anything like that, feel free to jump in at any time. I, I really prefer having sort of collaborative kind of conversations. Um, I've been working in biometric identification for over a decade. Most of that time, I was working for the Department of Defense building large-scale biometric identification systems. So if you think about all the, the television shows um, where they you know, give the glass to the criminal suspect and then they take it like, ah, we got his fingerprint and then they can go compare it to the database. Those large databases, um, the DOD started using biometrics when we st first went into Iraq. Um, traditionally, it was sort of a law enforcement thing and DOD didn't use it, but it was very useful. And so they spun up that capability very quickly. Um, I've gone back and forth to Iraq, Afghanistan, all the good stands many, many times um, doing these really complicated projects that were either access control or security and really had a lot of fun. Um, my co-founder in that picture is a PhD in computer engineering. Um, he did his research in artificial intelligence and is just a big, big brain in biometric identification. And really the, the goal for Blink Identity is we wanted to use this really cool technology in a way that preserved privacy and made life easier for individuals. So instead of being something that the government used, we wanted it to be something that individuals could use um, to make their life easier, better, or all of that. Um, and I don't know how videos work on Zoom, but we'll give it a shot. This is just a simple demo of our system. It's a tower sensor. It uses biometric face recognition. People who have enrolled are enabled to use the sensor. They can just walk in and we can identify them in full walking speed. They actually don't have to pause even though they're doing it. Um, and the idea really is to connect and pair that face and that strong identity to a ticket, to a credit card, to a driver's license saying I'm over 21 and I'm allowed to drink. You, know, you can attach all of these different attributes and then make life faster, easier. You know, there's a million different things, um, but the core of it is the individual is at the center of it all. Um, so before I go, I'm gonna do a really short thing on biometrics and then we'll talk about privacy. But before you can really talk about biometrics and specifically face recognition, I think it's helpful to think a little bit about human vision. Um, human vision is amazing. We walk around and we think the world is just out there and we see it, but what's actually happening to enable you to see is enormously complicated um, and it's really cool. About 30% of your brain is involved in vision as opposed to like 5% for hearing. So it is a complex task. You don't really see with your eyes, you see with your brain. Your eyes are just the lenses that let all of that data come in. Um, so if you think about a baby, the very first time they open their eyes, their eyes have never you know, actually functioned. And so at first they have a fixed focal length. They can't adjust to see far away or close. They don't have color vision. And it's, it's a kind of a blurry mess. And it develops over the first year of life. But even though, and this is a graphic of what we think you know, represents what babies can see. And even though they don't have color vision yet, and they're still working on focus by about three months, they can recognize their adult caregiver's face as, re as well as we can recognize the faces of people that we know. Um, and there's enormous you know, sort of survival advantage to that. So face recognition is something that is deeply a core part of our brain. There's a specific part of your brain that does it. And you do it without really thinking and realizing how incredibly complex it is. I think that's just amazing. We are so good at finding patterns and seeing patterns, specifically seeing faces. We see them when they're not there. And this is called pareidolia. They used to think that was a sign of mental illness. It's not. It's just that part of your brain that's constantly scanning, looking for faces that you know. We are social you know, we're designed to be social. And so that is an important part of it. I mean, it's just your brain doing that all of the time. And so if you think about the complexity of trying to get a computer to be able to see and recognize the spaces, here's another example that I think just sort of indicates how difficult the problem is. Um, a lot of people will just glancing at this have a hard time telling the difference between a blueberry muffin and a chihuahua because in many ways they're very similar. Um, and teaching a computer to do this, you know, can be similarly difficult. Um, I think a lot of times people are worried 
oh, AI is going to you know, take over the world, the, our robot overlords are going to be you know, ruling everything soon. But the reality is all of these things are just crude party types compared to human vision. What we do is so much more complex um, than what computers can do. Um, and here's another example. Um, human face recognition is really impressive, but the trick is we're really good at recognizing the faces of people that we know well, faces that are familiar to us. Um, on the left, we have two celebrities who are very frequently con you know, confused for each other. Um, at least they say that they are. And on the right, we actually have identical twins who are two different people. Now, the parents of these twins can tell them apart. They're very familiar faces. There's subtle differences. I, I, I met with them and we collected data. I can't tell them apart. Um, but everybody, it said, has somebody, a doppelganger, you know, who looks like you. And really the point I'm trying to make is identity is not binary. Um, even, not even worried about computers. When we look at people, it's not 100%. We've all had the experience of walking up to somebody and starting to talk to them and going, oh, oh, I'm sorry, I thought you were somebody else. It's not a binary simple thing, it's probabilistic. And that's true for humans and that's true for computers. Um, so let's just talk about biometrics. At the, the core, biometric is about identification. It's asking the question, who is this? Um, and I was, this is a, a great example that I think is fun because this is actually Drew Carey. It's just two different pictures of the same person. And I've stared at this picture trying to see if I could tell um, and I, I can't, I, I don't know how computers do it because I, these don't look remotely the same to me. But that is the question we're trying to answer. And all systems have some things in common regardless of the modality they're using. At some point, you have to do go through the enrollment process. And that's where you collect the biometric modality that you're going to use along with demographic information, like name, email address, whatever. And those are put into a computerized system. And then after you enrolled, you can either verify or identify that person. And so verification, you're probably most familiar with if you have an iPhone. You've enrolled by taking a few pictures of yourself that are stored on the phone. And then we, you, when you wanna open your phone, it collects what's called a probe image, which is a, another image of that face. And then it does a one-to-one -one match to verify your identity claim. I am claiming, I am married, this is my phone, you know, let me in. It's verifying that claim. Identification um, in a lot of ways seems like the same thing, but it's actually a one-to-end matching. It's I have a large data set of all kinds of identities and do I know who this person is? Can you identify this person? Um, and the real difference is just one-to-end matching is much more computationally complex and it's, it's a much more difficult problem. One hallmark of all biometrics, and this again is regardless of modalities, this is fingerprint, face, and iris, which are the most common ones, but any of them, is whatever image you collect, we don't really do anything with those. Those images are immediately converted into what's called a template. Templates are generally proprietary to all of the different vendors, and um, they don't have to be, but it's really, really tricky to, to do it any other way. So if you see this photograph, which is almost two megabytes, that's huge. When it's converted into a template, it's a 423-byte string of numbers, effectively. And we do all of our matching or identification with templates. And there's some security features there. A template can never go back to a photograph. There's just too much data that's been dropped. And generally, not everybody does this, but we delete our photographs because we don't need them after we've enrolled. Once we have a template, we're good. So we really do all of our matching with templates and a customer key. And that's that's all we have. Um, you don't have the data, you don't have to protect it and life is easier for everybody. And that's true of fingerprints, iris, um, there's an ear biometric, whatever biometric it is, they're almost always converted into templates. And then the templates are used to do the actual matching. Um, just a verification identification, I spoke to that, so we'll skip through this one. But you can imagine how much more difficult identification is. Um, with verification, you're really comparing two images, maybe one or two, um, and it's generally a lot easier to get an accurate answer. Um, again, we're gonna talk about accuracy and the kinds of errors that you can have. Matching, it's, it's probabilistic, so you know it's never going to be perfect. There is no perfection in the world. Um, there's really four conditions when you do a match. If the two faces don't match for real and the algorithm says they don't match, that's a true negative. If the two faces don't match, but the algorithm says they do, then that's called a false positive or a false match. 
If they actually are the same face and the algorithm says they're not a match, that's a false negative, a false non-match. Or if they really do match and the algorithm says they match, it's a true positive. Now, we don't really care that much about true negatives and true positives because those are correct. Those are the answers we want. Um, but instead of having to talk about one error, you really have to talk about two kinds of errors, false positives and false negatives. And if you're talking to a vendor and they talk about their error rate and they only have one, you need to really question whether they know what they're doing and what they're telling you because they really need to be talking about two different error rates or they're not doing it right. Um, a false match um, is, again, two, two faces are not the same person. The algorithm incorrectly says that they are. Um, it's really, really rare. Um, and you can tune these algorithms to be more accurate and wonder, actually, I'm gonna talk about that later. Um, false not match is just simply the same person. Computer says it's not, it's pretty straightforward. Um, but what is interesting to me is that these two error types are inversely proportional. And this, again, this is industry-wide. This is true of every algorithm. It's just the way the math works out. So as you tune the algorithm to be really, really good and make sure that your non-matches are low, your, your false matches will go up. And, and there's just no getting away from that. As you reduce one error, the other one goes up. And so you would think that you would set the threshold at that where the red dot is on this image, which is sort of the lowest point of both kinds of errors. But in reality, that's almost never what people do. What they do is they think about the use case and then they tune their algorithms to fit. So for example, in a law enforcement application, um, and I don't really, I haven't worked with law enforcement in a couple of years, but I, I don't think this has changed. They generally tune their algorithms because they want every match possible. They will accept a whole bunch of false matches as long as not a single true match gets past them. And they're okay with that because one of the things they do in law enforcement, I just think this is interesting and it, it really comes from the history of biometrics. When they're back when they only had fingerprints, they actually would have human beings were the fingerprint matchers. You know, they would have two cards, they would have filing cabinets, a warehouse full of filing cabinets of fingerprint cards. They would get a, a latent print and they would literally card by card manually match them, which you can imagine is a hideous process. And so when they started computerizing it, one of the things they were really concerned about is they did not want computers making decisions. And so, because of that decision in the 70s, that sort of all biometric systems sort of inherited this attitude. And so when you make a match, the computer doesn't say, oh, here's the match. Because if you ask, is this person in my database? And let's say it's a, a, a mugshot database and I'm trying to find a criminal. If I say, no, this isn't in the database, then the computer has made a decision, which they didn't want. And if I give you one image and I say, yes, he's in the database, here he is the computer made a decision and they also did not want that. And so what they decided is that the computer will always return the top 20 candidates. And then a human will go through and manually review those top 20 and determine if there's a match or a non-match. And even if the second person matches, they will look at all 20, make their determination, and then it'll actually get verified independently by a second person. And then a third person will compare to make sure that they got the right answer. And this was all you know, in the 70s when they were just really worried about computers making decision and taking their job away. This is what humans do. Honestly, I think you can make a case these days that the computers are less susceptible to human error or the human error is more, um, more of a factor, but it doesn't really matter. That's still how it's done in law enforcement. And it's still to some extent how it's done. You have a list of possible matches and you have to decide that what's the threshold that I'm gonna set. Um, Disneyland takes the opposite approach. They use biometrics for their season pass holders. If they have a false non-match, somebody who has a season pass is gonna be told, nope, sorry, you can't come in. And they're gonna to have to go you know, and do it again. And that's annoying when you're best customers. Now there's an infinitesimally small up chance that they might accidentally let somebody in who isn't actually a season pass holder, but that's actually less bad than you know, annoying one of your best customers, your most profitable customers. And so they tune their algorithms in a totally different direction. Um, there's a couple of uh, misconceptions about face recognition. Um, there are things that can fool it and there's things that don't. And we often will have people ask about hats, sunglasses, things like that. So I'm gonna give you a minute just to look at these different images. And then on the next slide, I'll show you which ones will actually mess up face recognition. 
So you can just look at each of those and, and take your own, you know, which do you think will be a problem? And so most of them are no problem at all. Hats, sunglasses, jewel, face paint, all of that stuff is not an issue at all. On the lower left, if your head is down or if you have a hat and we can't really see your eyes well enough, we're probably not gonna be able to find the face, which means we won't be able to match it. And if you have um, a facial expression that distorts it enough, it may not be able to find a face. And that's where most of the errors will come from. If you can't find the face, you can't match the face. Um, face finding is sort of the weakness for biometrics. As long as you can find a face, you will almost always be able to match it. But if you are worried about living in a surveillance society, which I think I absolutely think would be a terrible thing, just look down. Um, as long as the computers are seeing the top of your head, they're never gonna be able to match your face. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the privacy laws that we have right now. And I have to say this, I am not a lawyer. Um, this is not legal advice, and this particular thing is changing constantly. Um, so if this is important to you, you really need to go and find. Um, there are a number of people who are opening um, little consultancies that do privacy consult consultation. Definitely work with some of those. I'm also not talking about GDPR, even though we are familiar with that and do a lot of work with it, just because it doesn't apply in the United States. But if there's questions about GDPR, I can speak to that. Um, so there's really, at the, at the federal level, there, there's no biometric privacy law. I wish there were, it would make my life so much easier. Um, but what we do have are the Privacy Act of 1974 that really regulates how federal agencies collect data and maintain it. Um, you as a citizen have a right to see that data and there's a lot of there. And then after that, we did COPPA, which is how websites interact with data and collect data from children. Um, HIPAA, which everyone's heard with, you know, your health records, and then the Graham-Leach, I can't even pronounce this one, is really all about financial information. So that's not really relevant, although what we're starting to see is there are a lot of states that have data privacy laws that are very similar, and then sometimes they'll just add the word biometric, and bam, they have a biometric data law. Legally, what counts as a biometric? And the, this is kind of a problem because every law addresses this differently. Some of them have very specific, this is a biometric, I've defined it, and then they've defined it, they don't include face. And that's my favorite when Texas has biometrics, you know, fingerprints, palm veins, you know, all of this stuff, but they don't include face, which is the most commonly used commercial um, biometric modality. And so depending on how you want to interpret that, face recognition doesn't count. Um, but the other problem is almost anything can be a biometric. Face, fingerprint, and iris are the most common um, commercial modalities, but there's actually an ear biometric. I don't know why anyone would use that. The way you walk, your gait is a biometric. Your voice is obviously a biometric and can be used to identify you. The way you type, just the cadence pattern and the pressure on a keyboard, that's a biometric. And there's new ones coming out all of the time. And so almost anything that uniquely identifies a person can be a biometric modality. And every law and every state that has a law defines this differently, which is just one of those things that makes it really complicated. And there are currently nine states that have biometric privacy laws. There are other states that are have either raised them and they didn't pass that they'll probably get raised again, or they have um, partial laws um, there's more states than this that have rules about collecting biometrics that only apply to school districts. So I haven't put that here. I don't think that's really relevant. If you are selling into school districts and doing some kind of an IT product, you probably already know about that. Um, but it's really kind of a messy, complicated thing because it's just all over the map. It's different everywhere you go. Although most states, as you can still, as you can see, still don't have any kind of anything. Um, again, I'm really hoping that we have some kind of federal level thing that will just simplify the rules for everybody. But until then, what we have is BIPA, the Illinois Biometric Information Privacy Act. And this was passed in 2008. And the reason this is kind of our de facto standard is because it's the most restrictive, um, it's the most difficult. And if you have customers in Illinois, you have to deal with this. And so Google, Facebook, you know, Disney, all of these people have had to go wrestle with this one. And there's a couple of things that are really interesting here. If you look, it was passed in 2008. So it's a very, very old law. 
it was originally brought up because there were a couple of companies that were starting to use fingerprint scanners as time clocks and people got worried. If my fingerprint is released, you know, God knows what will happen. And then and that actually said, this is a sort of a side note. That is something I kind of want to talk about because I've had people, I've even read lawyers say, you know, biometric data is even more important than regular data because once your biometric gets out there, I can, like, I can reset my password, but I can't reset my face. And that's, that's actually not the way to think about it because you're, your face isn't the password, your face is your login ID. Um, it doesn't really matter that your biometric can't be reset. One, we're gonna turn it into a template anyway, but you're being photographed all the time. Every time you go out in public, you're not invisible. Um, there are fingerprint sensors that if you just hold your hands up from like 10 feet away, they can get your fingerprints, anything you touch. I mean, you leave fingerprints everywhere you go. Um, the iris is a little bit harder to collect, but we can actually match irises from 10 to six feet away as long as you're not wearing glass, uh, dark sunglasses. Um, there's other biometrics. And if you're really worried about being tracked, I mean, just don't have a phone because your cell phone collects far more information, including your location in real time. It can be turned on remotely with a warrant, um, far more invasive than anything about biometrics. Um, and there's a lot of misinformation about the accuracy of biometrics. There's a lot of people saying, oh, they don't work. And a lot of that is because it's complicated to talk about accuracy, but NIST does an ongoing test. And in their last one, which was about six months ago, the top, I mean, there are like 200 algorithms that were submitted. So obviously there's a range, but the top 10 algorithms were all indistinguishable from each other. And they were effectively perfect. And all of them were far better than humans. Because again, we're not really very good at face recognition. We're very good at recognizing the faces that we know, but recognizing others we're not very good at. And that's true for everyone. There's that old joke, oh, well, you know, I grew up here. Other people, they all look alike. But that's that's true for everybody. Whatever group you grew up in, people who don't look like that all look alike to you, whether, you know, wherever you grew up. Um, so the algorithms aren't better at us than recognizing the people that we know, but they are better at recognizing strangers, um, especially if you need to go look through you know, a database of thousands of strangers. An algorithm will massively outperform a human being every time. Um, I kind of wish I'd known that when I was in college and I, didn't, I wasn't old enough to go to bars, um, but in a well-lit lab environment, when they are testing a human being who will look at a driver's license and then look at a person, they're about 65, 70% accurate. And so if you actually go into a bar where it's dark and they don't really care that much, it's about 50-50. If you have a driver's license with the right gender, you can probably get in. Um, I just didn't know that you know, until it no longer mattered. Um, I'm sorry, but back to, to Illinois. Um, the big thing about the Illinois law is that individuals can sue for damages. This is the only state it's true. Most of the time, if you violate one of these laws, the state attorney general has to decide that something happened was bad enough for it to be worth him bringing a case. Um, so there has to be some kind of significant data breach or something to get their attention. In Illinois, any individual can sue. Um, and again, it's an old law. People kind of forgot it even happened and then biometrics kind of exploded. And so there were a lot of lawsuits. Somebody realized, oh, hey, there's this law in the books. Let's go after all of these big companies who violated it. I mean, Facebook, if you have my picture and you tagged it, you violated BIPA. And so if, I don't know if you've been reading this in the news, but the first thing everyone did is they tried to, to say, hey, it doesn't matter. We violated the law, but nobody was harmed. Generally in a lawsuit, if you can't prove that you were harmed, it doesn't matter. Um, and so the biometric uh, law specifically states, if, my, if, if you violate the law, I have been harmed. And so many people with deep pockets have tried to sort of fight BIPA and win on the count that, well, okay, I tagged the photograph, but nobody saw it. It was private, doesn't matter. They have not won. They've had to pay massive amounts of money um, to, to do all of this. Um, and so specifically in BIPA, you have to get consent, informed consent. You have to say what you're collecting and you have to tell them your retention policy. The one that's really tricked up a lot of people is you have to have a written retention data for policy for your data, and it has to be public. Um, and you have to have it in two different ways. Um, and I think, I think it was Six Flags. They did everything right. They got consent. They collected everything. They, they did everything right. 
but their public retention policy was only on their website. They didn't have a second way that was enough for them to lose. And now every single person had a, I think it was a $2,000 in damages for every collection, which is again, just massive amounts of money. Um, the lock has restrictions on selling and sharing of data and you have to store data at or above um, your, as, as securely as you're um, securing other data at your company at the highest standard. Um, and you'll see this um, kind of language written as we go through the other states. And again, Illinois is kind of a de facto standard now because any individual can sue and they, there's whole cottage industries of lawyers who are now reaching out to people saying, hey, I will sue for you. You'll get 50%, I get 50%, just sign here. Um, so it's something you wanna really, really be careful about if you have any users who are in the state of Illinois. Texas actually has a biometric law that's very, very old, 2009. Um, and it's really interesting to me. And again, its focus was on protecting employees who were using uh, fingerprints for um, time cards. Um, before you collect it, you have to tell them that you're collecting biometric information. You have to get explicit consent. You can't shell, sell, lease, or disclose it. Um, there's restrictions on how you can share it. Again, you have to use a reasonable standard of care for data storage, which is generally accepted to mean you have to store it the way you store your most secure data at your company. Um, and then you have to destroy the, the data when it's no longer needed or up to a year since a, a year after it's been used. Washington State um, more recently came up with their own one. Um, and this is really commercial use only. There's something I think you wanna think about. Law enforcement using this kind of stuff gets you into sort of this black mirror and being tracked by the world, you know, stuff that, that can be really creepy, um, but a lot of these laws don't apply to law enforcement. Um, but some of them do, and that's, I think, a good thing. Um, so it's commercial use. Again, before I collect data, I need to ask, and I have to get explicit consent. I can't share, sell, or lease it. Um, I can't share without consent. That same reasonable care for data storage, destroy it when no longer needed, no business use, or one year since its last use. So there's some similarities there. California, I think is the big one that just came in last year. Um, it's complicated and they keep making modifications to it. So all of this, all of this information could be superseded, you know, because this stuff is changing and updating on a, a daily basis, pretty much. But you'll see a lot of similarities. Before collecting data, you have to tell them what's being, you know, what you're collecting and get consent. Um, you can't, re if it's a one-time transaction and there's no need to store it, you can't store it. Um, California is interesting because your privacy policy has to be public and it has to be updated every 12 months. Um, and customers have to have two different ways to request that their data is deleted. Um, so that could be you know, a phone number they call and an email address. There could be a form on the website and an email address, but you have to have two. And this is similar to Illinois in that you can actually have effectively done everything right and you can still end up you know, in trouble with the law, so to speak, if you're not following some of these titchy rules, because some of the, some of them are, are very oddly specific in odd ways. Um, but California doesn't have a right of private action. So again, it would have to be something, uh, a data breach or something that was significant enough to come to the attention of the attorney general. New York, uh, stop hacks and improve electronic data security act shield. The acronyms are just hilarious to me. Um, if you're gonna collect information on large numbers of New Yorkers, you have to tell them why, and you have to collect only the data for that purpose. Um, they individuals have the right to see that data you know, and, and talk about it and ask for it to be erased. And if you collect and store biometric data, you're held to the high, again, this is that same level of standard as your highest level of data that you, you store, you have to do it at that. So again, a lot of similarities for the different states. Um, Colorado did something that a lot of states are doing. There's four more states right now that are talking about doing this, which is just adding biometrics to their existing data security rules and just adding that one word and we're done. Um, in Colorado, you have to notify the attorney general if you have either 500 people um, who have been affected in a breach and you have to notify the credit reporting agencies if it's over a thousand. You have to destroy all the data if it's no longer needed or if it's been one year. Um, you have to have reasonable safeguards Okay, that is a problem with some of these laws. What does that mean? You know, some of the, the details on this can be really, really tricky. Um, they require written policies governing the disposal of all of this data. Um, and the school district may not collect certain information. 
this is actually really, really common. There are, there's nine states with privacy laws. I think there's 12 or 13 states that either restrict or will not allow school districts to collect biometric information on children. Um, Arkansas, they just did this fairly recently. They added um, biometric data to their Personal Information Protection Act, which very standard, very similar to all these other things that you've seen. Um, and then their bi biometric data is defined as, you know, pretty much anything. And again, that I guess that leaves you open if we come up with new biometrics that become commercially um, viable, they don't have to go back and rewrite their statute. Um, but in some cases, it's not helpful. Um, Oregon is really interesting. Um, they don't have anything at the state level, but at Portland, they actually have a total moratorium on the use of biometrics at all. Private, um, police, everyone. I mean, technically, if you want to read it that way, they had to go back after it passed and write in some changes because technically it restricted the use of the iPhone. You weren't allowed to unlock your phone um, with your face without violating the Portland law. Um, if you go actually read the law itself, it was reported as, you know, this is the most restrictive rule, you can't do it anywhere. What it literally says is you can't do it unless you fill out a form and you get permission and nobody's done that yet. And nobody's really certain because it's a very, very new law. Um, it's really vague on whether that, applies, can't even speak today, whether that applies to private industry or not. Um, so it's possible because we, we were waiting to see what the lawyers say, um, they clearly intended this to be for police um, because that is explicitly stated. It is not clear whether like a private club could use that because it, they just didn't write it very clearly and we're waiting to see how that plays out. But if you really think about it, the best practices for this is pretty common sense. And if you looked at all of those laws, it's very similar. And all of the ones, the different states who are working on laws, and there's a bunch that are, they're generally uh, using BIPA, the Illinois law, as sort of a template and then making minor modifications. You want to have a written policy on how you collect, use, and store biometric data when you're, you know, all of those things. And then you need to follow those policies. They're no good if you don't actually do it. Um, another step that's really important, this is absolutely required by GDPR. It's not required by some of these laws, but it's a really, really good idea clearly and concisely inform everybody on what you're collecting, how you're handling it. And that's real informed consent. And for GDPR, that means you can't have a box that says privacy policy link, I accept, okay. You actually have to tell them in human you know, readable ways what it is that you're doing and you have to present that to them before they're allowed to consent, um, which again, it's kind of a pain, but it makes sense. Um, a lot of times they're vague and they will say you should store this data at the highest standard, but generally you should be um, encrypting it in, trans in, rest in transit and at rest. Again, these are pretty common sense things to do. Um, limit access to the data, and this includes vendors. So this is one of the things that gets really, really complicated when you start doing projects where I'm working with multiple vendors and my vendors have vendors, but they have access to your data. You really have to think about who has access to what and then when you write those contracts, hiring this vendor, signing up for their service, you need to make sure that all of your rules about how biometric data is handled is your vendors are going to agree to that as well. Um, and really think through who has access and why and limit it as much as possible. Um, for example, I, you know, we are a biometric company. I don't have access to any of that data. I'm a CEO, but I don't need it. And it would be stupid for me to have access to that. Um, collect and store minimum amount of data. This is, I'm, I'm sure all of you guys are familiar with this, but you know, in the old days, it was just collect everything and then we'll see if it's useful later. Um, it was very common recently, until recently, to collect photographs for face recognition and then you would just keep them because you never know. You know or it's really nice to be able to, when somebody walks in, show their picture and go, you know, welcome Mary with a little, you know, a little thumbnail. People like seeing themselves. But is that really necessary for the business use? I'm trying to use this to get into a building. I'm connecting it to my ticket. Do I really need that photograph? And I mean, if you do, if there's a business use, great. But really think through what do I need and only keep what you absolutely have to have for that business purpose. Um, and only retain it as long as needed. Again, the tendency is just to keep everything and worry about it later because you're worried that we accidentally got rid of something that turned out to be useful. Um, but in reality, it's 
much better just to get rid of things that you don't have a specific need for, because if you don't have it, you don't have to protect it. You don't have to worry about it. Um, we have an astonishingly small amount of data. We generally have um, at that template I told you about, usually a name and an email address. And then we have a key that we share with either a ticketing company, a point of sale company, whoever it is you know, that we're working with, and that's it. Um, and we don't want anything else. Um, and then, as always, review these policies on a regular basis and make sure that they're, you know, that everybody at the company knows about them. And again, back to number one, that they're actually being followed, because that is the number one um, thing that I've seen as I go read all of the articles. I'm very interested in privacy, obviously, and I'm following all this. What we generally see is, yeah, the policy was there. It just wasn't followed. That doesn't help you at all. So that is the end of what I have to say, but mostly I would love to have questions and have a discussion about these issues. Anybody have any questions? Looks like there's a few in the chat from Hazel and Bill. Uh, hang on, I am not, not seeing that part. Or I'm Hazel wants to unmute herself and ask the questions. Yeah, that, that's useful, just ask. <laughs> Hi, can you hear me? Absolutely. Oh, right. Um, hi, uh, fantastic presentation and really interesting, of course, particularly as I'm working in the healthcare sector. So therefore, uh, I, I have some questions on that. Um, and forgive me, I joined late. Did you mention or and if you didn't, do you have any thoughts on uh, blockchain for uh, the level of security of data and, you know, any, any knowledge on that? Yeah, it, to me, blockchain is really interesting if you need to have that chain of custody of, you know, it went from here to here, you know, to here. And especially in healthcare, when records are going all over the place, I, I can see a use there. It doesn't really, our model is we're really focusing on, you know, we identify people and then something happens. And so there really is no chain. Once you're in, we don't store anything. You know, so for example, um, we work with Ticketmaster. If you decide, you know, you buy a ticket from Ticketmaster and I want to be able to use the blink entrance, I walk in, but there's nothing else to store after that. Okay. Um, and we already have the template, which sort of serves a very similar purpose in that it's anonymizing that piece of information. Okay. I, I guess really my follow-up question, if I may, uh, mm -hmm. well, it was- And I am not a blockchain expert at, a, at any sense. Okay. Um, would you agree healthcare is different as an industry with the laws as each organization which would implement such a solution would require patient consent anyhow? Yeah, no, healthcare is enormously complicated. And I have to say, I'm not sure that HIPAA did what it was intended to do. And I don't know that it's helped. Um, and there's massive misunderstanding. I actually had somebody at work my husband sent me a thing, you know, from a test he did. And I'm like, oh, look, you know, he's healthy. And they're like, oh, you violated HIPAA. And I'm like, it doesn't apply to me. I can't violate it. I'm an individual. You know, it, my husband might have, you no, know, he couldn't even violate it when he shared it with me because it's his. Um, but it's very, very complicated. And if you want it, again, healthcare is a whole um, industry on its own that is uh -huh. requires an enormous amount of expertise because the data handling rules are so very complicated. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Hey, Bill, did you have something or you're just talking about the, oh, you were just mentioning the Drew Carey images and it was hard for him to tell <laughs> the oh. older ones and things like that. So yeah, makes sense. Um, let's see, any thoughts on the Texas data, Texas DPS data breach that seems to have occurred recently? Well, actually, yeah, last I remember. Mean, I have to admit, I'm getting jaded because I had a um, I had a security clearance. I have a top secret clearance, and everything on me. I mean, they had massive amounts of data because they not only have pretty much every single thing about me, they go and interview a bunch of your family and get information about them. They do all these verbal. I mean, just massive amounts of data, and the Chinese got all of that. Um, I pretty much assume that anything that I've put out there is out there. Um, and that there's no privacy because you just have to assume that or you're going to get in trouble. Um, the government is now helpfully paying for, you know, the SIS service that monitors, you know, breach and all, and it's, it's fairly useless. Um, so I really focus on, you know, least amount of data, secure passwords, change them frequently, and then just being thoughtful about what information am I sharing and who am I sharing it with? Um, you know, 
driver's license, most, I have a, a slide I used to put in there. I'm trying to think of the number. There are a surprising number, I think about 20 states that share their driver's license information with the federal government, meaning it can be used by any of the police, any of these organizations, um, DHS, all of them pretty much have your face. If you're an adult human and you have a driver's license or if you've done anything you know, as an adult that involved taking a picture by any kind of a government organization, the government has your face in a face database. They have already associated it with all kinds of information and they are using and scanning that for all kinds of things. And that ship has kind of sailed. Um, I assume the Chinese and everybody, you know, has everything on me. Um, I don't assume that my social security number is going to do anything because I know they have that. That's out all over the place. Um, I don't know that there's a lot you can do about that anymore. That almost the whole privacy is dead thing because biometrics and everything else. There's so many data points out there now. There's so much. And this is one of the things I think it's interesting about biometrics specifically, because I do have a lot of global, you know, it's it's worse for face recognition, you know, and I'm like, look, if, if you go to a baseball game, you know, you tell your boss, I'm sick, and then you go to a baseball game, okay, it's not 100% that you're not going to bump into somebody you know, you might show up on the jumbotron and your boss finds out, I mean, you're not invisible. You are walking around a stadium, you know, with 80,000 people, they can all see you might bump into somebody, you know, it's just not very likely. Um, and it, it's, it's similar, you know, yeah, there is that data breach, but what is the likelihood that something's going to happen? Um, but this is one place where I think the, there are legal precedences that I'm very happy about. Um, and forgive me for a little bit of a long-winded story. Back in, I think, the 80s, I'm not really sure when, they came up with GPS trackers that you could put on a car. Um, and they were small and they were inexpensive. Before that, they were crazy expensive and they were huge, but you could actually just slip it on a car without anyone noticing. And so the police started using them willy-nilly. They would just slap them on any car they wanted and then watch to see where they went. Did they go you know, to this other person of interest? And it became a tool that they depended on in investigating crime. And somebody brought it to court and said, hey, that's an unconstitutional you know, search. You can't do that. And the police said, sure we can. I mean, we're just automating what we do anyway. You know, if, if you're a suspect, I can follow you. I can get in an unmarked car and I can drive around and I can watch where you go. But what the court said is, yeah, you can. You can follow one person. But this is a technology that's letting you follow all of the people. And that is unreasonable search. And so they can't use GPS trackers now without a warrant, which I think is excellent. Um, and I think you can see what I'm hoping happens is that we will come up with a precedent like that with some of these other technologies. And it's not just face recognition. Um, I can track one person, you know, through their cell phone, but you know, the technology lets me track everyone. We need to have warrants. We need to have rules about what data is collected, how it's used by law enforcement. I'm honestly far more concerned about law enforcement than I am um, you know, like Disney or whatever private rules, Google, Facebook, all of that data, I am under, when it's under my control, I can see it, I can delete it, but they also are held um, to the court of public opinion. If everybody decides they're evil and stops using them, that's something that they can be held accountable for. The police, you know, the state and federal agencies, you have no idea what data they have, but not only do you not know, you can't find out. You can't ask them, and if you do ask them, they can lie to you. Um, and there's absolutely no accountability there. So that's something I'm far more concerned about. Um, I think the restrictions on government use of face recognition are excellent and we need to continue doing that. Um, not because the technology is flawed and it doesn't work, it worked really well. It's because it allows people to be lazy and they start letting the computer do their job instead of actually doing the job themselves. It's not supposed to be an easy job. Let's see, Matt Snyder was asking, are there any differences to the way companies are behaving due to the Illinois law besides meeting the letter of it? Yeah, um, massively. And, and there have been, I'm trying to remember how much Facebook, so I mean, it was massive amounts of money that Facebook had to pay. Google, I mean, everybody has gone up and tried to fight it with all of their best lawyers. Everyone has lost. Um, nobody has been able to beat this one yet. Um, and really it comes down to like in Illinois, the face tagging feature is not enabled. If you go, if you're an Illinois resident and you sign up for Facebook, <laughs> there's no tagging. Um, I don't know how they know for certain that you're, I guess, yeah, I guess when you create the account, you know, cause that's really all that matters. It's not that you're in Illinois, that you are based in Illinois when you created the account. 
Um, and so they actually have made some you know, rules so that if you're an Illinois resident, you see a different set of features, you have a different set of options. Um, but other companies have just decided to take Illinois as a de facto federal standard because it's just easier to have one code base and have one set of rules and processes for everybody. You know, uh, Mary, I don't, I don't know if, uh, if, you, if it's proprietary or not, but what are the main things that, that go into the recognition and, like, you know, and, and, and deciding you are, you know, your, your picture is, is you? Is it, is it the, the facial, the bones under the face? Is it like, what if you what? Yeah, I love this question. Like, you're going to hate my answer. Um, the answer is we don't know. Nobody knows. Um, they're, what they're generally doing is they're taking algorithms and they're taking batched pairs. So here's two pictures of Mary and then here's pictures of other people. And you send them to an algorithm and you say, these people match, these people don't match. And then the computer starts predicting. And then it's using machine learning and, and deep learning has made this far more accurate. And I'm, this is a gross simplification. Over time, it learns pretty much the way you learn. I mean, it's effectively the way humans do it, and which is, we don't know. I mean, when you look at your Aunt Martha, how do you know that that's Aunt Martha? What is your brain doing? You don't know. She just sort of has an Aunt Martha-esque quality. Um, so what we can do is say, when we've taken just truly massive amounts of data, and we have two people who look alike to me, you know, the Drew Carey, for example, we can test an algorithm because again, we have match sets, we know the ground truth. These two people are the same, these two people are not the same. And so then we can go test the algorithm. And what we can say is over time, the algorithms have gotten better and better and better. And now they are better than humans when looking at strangers, but we still don't know how they do it. Interesting. Thank well, you. and that is part of the art of machine vision in general is constructing those data sets. It is an art as much of a science. Um, there is. This isn't really true anymore, but it used to be that face recognition was far more accurate on white males. Um, and the embarrassing reason for that is you had to come up with really large data sets of people where I had multiple pictures of the person like a headshot where I knew who they were, I knew the ground truth, and I need to have multiple ones of all these different people. Well, where am I gonna get those data sets? That's hard, it's expensive, it's difficult. College students, you know, they, they are members of massive numbers of psychology experiments. You're like, here, free pizza for your fraternity. If you let me take your picture, tend to be white male. They tend to be in you know, 18 to 22. And so that was the data set that was used to train the algorithms originally. Um, and so it's the algorithms are gonna be good based on the data. And so people went, well, that's bad. They've retuned, redone the, and redone their data sets to have a better um, more distributed uh, set of characteristics. And so the algorithms improved. Um, they had one of the very first machine vision problems. This is ages ago. They were trying to teach an algorithm to determine tanks. This is the DOD project. And so they, again, you feed in massive numbers of pictures. These are all the US tanks. These are all the Chinese tanks. These are all the Russian tanks. You know, all of the pictures of every tank you could get, which isn't very many and probably not enough. And so after a while they would test it. And so they'd show it a US tank and it said US tank. They'd show it a Chinese tank. It said, China, you know, not a U.S. tank, Chinese tank. I'm like, wow, this is amazing. But what they figured out pretty quickly was that all of the pictures of U.S. tanks had come from the vendors. And so they were full color, very clear pictures of tanks. All of the Chinese, all of the Russian, all of the foreign tanks were from reconnaissance photos. So they tended to have um, limited color spectrum and they were kind of blurry. And so what they'd actually taught the algorithm to do is to distinguish between full color, clear photos and blurry photos without clear color. It wasn't actually doing what they thought it was doing at all. You could send it any clear picture and it would say, that's a US tank. <laughs> very, very cool. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is a kind of funny story. I mean, it's amazing to me. Machine vision is both just astonishing, amazing, astonishingly complex and amazing. And it's also a crude party trick all at the same time because human vision is just so impressive. Human vision is so much more than what you see. Your brain is taking things away from what you see. For example, you can see your nose all of the time. Anytime your eye is open, you can see your nose. We filter it out because it's not useful, except now most of you are seeing your nose and it's probably annoying. Um, the other thing is you have two big blind spots just offset of the center of your vision because there's a hole in your retina where your optic nerves goes through to your brain. 
and you literally have a blind spot, but you don't see it because your brain invents information and puts it there. So as you look around, it sees what's there and it extrapolates, moves, it fills in the, the gap. And so you're literally seeing things that don't exist. Um, human vision is just amazing and we will never be able to come, we're not even remotely close to that with machine vision. It's really, really good at doing that one party trick, which is I can compare two faces millions and millions of times in a row. Humans can't do that. They get bored, um, they get tired and they just don't have the ability to pay attention that often. Um, and computers can do that really, really well. But I can take a picture of my husband and I could tear like a corner of it off and I could just see a fourth of his face. I can still tell that that's my husband. I could probably even tell you what the photo was, where he was, what he was wearing that day. You know, a computer will never be able to do that. Interesting. Yeah, I, I, I definitely can see my nose now and it's really disturbing. <laughs> Sorry, that's one of those things that's very annoying. It'll go away eventually. Your brain will stop attending to it. Um, well, it's probably like the contacts where I have one for near and one for far so I don't have to wear reading glasses. And uh, I can't really tell anymore. You know, it's just like, that's the way it is. And I can see close and see far, but it's one eye doing one job and the other eye doing the other. But it, somehow yep. it works. But like when you're driving, if you look at the car in front of you, all you're really seeing is a rectangle. But your brain knows that it's a car based on what it is. It knows what kind of car it is. And it actually allocates space in front of that car that you don't literally see, but you have an awareness of how far in front of you that car goes, how fast it's going, all of those things that you think you're seeing, you're not. Your brain is creating information out of nothing in some sense, and it's giving it to you. It's just, you think you see it. It's not, you yeah, just kind of know. And, and that's why law enforcement, you know, says that the eyewitnesses are sometimes like the worst thing because they sort of make up what they think they saw and they think that's right. true. Yeah, yeah, human memory is, is actually amazingly bad. Um, and there's a lot of studies and a lot of things you can read on that. And then every time you remember something, we think of the analogy as like, I'm, I'm replaying a videotape, but actually every time you remember something, your brain is reconstructing it. And so the more times you recall it, the more it will deviate from, act, from what actually happened. I mean, there's a lot of really interesting studies of things where they actually, there was one of these things where they actually talked to somebody over and over and over and were able to convince him that he'd been on a balloon ride as a child and that he dropped a teddy bear. And I, was, I mean, just by asking questions and he was like, no, that never happened. Don't you remember that? And they just over and over and over. And finally he's absolutely, I remember it. And he did, he really did remember it. And then they brought his mom in. He was like, what are you talking about? You were never in a hot air balloon. Um, <laughs> but our, our memory is, is uh, it's not what we think it is. Very interesting. It is. Very cool stuff. See, uh, we're actually at the top of the hour here, so I know some people are going to drop off. And I want to say thank you, Mary, before anybody else oh, leaves. Sure. And this has been great. I mean, you know, there's a lot of conversations in the chat going on, too, about just what Blink does behind the scenes. Like, I mean, Matt's asking about the Blink process, about we don't keep data, we just match it. How does it actually work? Because you obviously don't yeah, have data. Oh, wait, the I pictures, found but, chat. I can yeah. get in there now. Um, yeah, what we yeah. generally do is... So you enroll by taking a selfie. We don't have like a database somewhere else. The only way to get into our database is you put yourself in it by taking a photograph. Um, and if we don't take it well enough, we will you know, ask you to take another one. And then that's connected to something. So if you're buying a ticket, it's connected to that, that ticketing thing. Um, if you are using it for payments, it's connected to you know, your information for that credit card. And now you can go up to a register, for example, we're working on a prototype right now where you walk up, we recognize your face, we go and pull using that template, we find you in our database, we find that payment information and the payment information is loaded without you having to pull out your credit card, swipe it or do anything like that. Um, does that answer the question? So thanks, thanks Mary. I mean, so, so there is a copy that you're matching against essentially is the idea, right? Like you, you do have a database to I'm sorry, we have a database of templates. We don't have a database of photographs. So and, and, uh, then where would my photograph go? Like, like and, and, and if this is too much for the conversation, it's okay. I'm just- No, 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 that's fine. Like if I, I, I register for Ticketmaster because I want to, you know, sell my ticket as, to, a, you know, as a resale or something like that, right? Do mm -hmm. they keep the, did, I mean, did they keep it? Does it stay on my phone in an app? Does it sort of, I'm just curious, like where, where is the system of record kind of? Um, well, I can, I can speak to us. Um, for us, once we, we take your photo, when you enroll, you take a photograph. 
we convert it into a template and then we discard the photograph. We don't keep it. Other people like Facebook, you know, has a million of your photographs and they keep it and everybody does it a little differently. In general, for all of the different biometric things out there, they used to always just keep the photographs because we might need it someday. Or, you know, when I pull up the app, people like seeing their little headshot there, it's just cool. Um, the new trend or the thing that people are moving towards is deleting it. Because again, if I don't have that data, I don't have to protect it. I don't have to worry about a breach, you know, just connect the least amount of data. And that photograph is not necessary for me. It's, is the template like a hash? That's it's like a about. hash. It's very much like a hash, but it's not a hash because it's not a one-to-one, -one. it's probabilistic. Ah, uh, okay. Interesting. So a given template, um, every photograph of you will convert to a template that is probabilistically very much the same, but they're not identical. Okay. So then but that's a great way to think about it. Yeah, so then the law doesn't apply to a digital representation of my face in the form of a template. Which law? I, well, I, I guess I, so is the template my face or is it something kind of like my face? Are the templates yeah. like unique? It's, it's like a hash of your face, basically. Okay. And, and that, can that be reversed then? Can you take the data and make a picture out of it? Nope, never. Okay, so. And, and that is one of the great things about the template is it's a security feature because we can never go back to a photograph. Okay. And so is the template governed in the same way as a, as a photograph from a privacy perspective? Um, you know, that actually varies on how the laws are written and I expect we're going to see a consistency on this, which I welcome because right now it's very complicated. I behave as if it does. There are a few laws that don't, they don't talk about it. They talk about photographs explicitly. Um, more and more of the laws are not getting that detailed so they don't have these problems. Um, GDPR, definitely the template counts. Most of, like in Texas, I think if you, if you read it very closely, no, it, the template does not count as a biometric, which is stupid. Um, it ought to, but they talk very specifically about photographs. Um, actually, they don't even talk about photographs. They talk about fingerprints, palm vein, geometry, um, and I think retina. I'm not, I have to go look at that up. Um, the template, is the template very algorithmic specific though? They are, they're proprietary. So even if like Disney will have a, a template, if you use that, I can't use that one. I still have to have you enroll in my system. Okay. Cool, thank you for the information. That's really interesting, I appreciate it. Yeah, and I think the interesting thing about templates is originally, I mean, it, when we first started doing biometrics on computers, and if you go look this up, the history is kind of interesting. It all started because in World War II, they would have these enormous number of fingerprint cards that were manually looked at one by one. And there was really nothing you could do to make that job easier. They did a classification system on the kind. So your fingerprint is either a tent shape a whorl shape or a loop shape. And so they could at least, you know, I only have to look at a third of them. And there were a few other things that they could do, but it was just a nightmare job. And so think about computing in the seventies. I mean, these were mainframes. It was just an incredibly difficult thing to do. They had to convert it to templates because it would just take too long to send that much data across. I mean, a, a typical headshots, two megabytes. You know, if I'm trying to match in full, you know, full walking speed, I've got a quarter of a second to do everything I need to do. I can't work with two megabytes of data. It's just way too much. Um, and so originally converting it into a template was a way to reduce the computational load, reduce the database size, storage, all of it. Um, it's since then become seen as a security feature as well um, because they are proprietary and they can never go back to anything that's identifiable. Um, I did see a question. Yeah, the, temp the template is generally kept. Um, in our system, you can, you know, you can delete yourself out whenever you want um, and then re-enroll because we don't care. It's, it's cheap and it's easy. Um, for other systems, you enroll once and then you just get, you know, but they'll store that template. Um, and then whenever you take a photograph, I'm sorry, like for example, in our system, when you enroll, we take a, a picture, we turn it into a template and we store that. When you walk past our sensor, like you saw in that video, we're taking another image converting it to a template, we're comparing it through our entire set as we're doing identification, finding that template and going, yes, and then saying, do they have a ticket? Yes, the light turns green and they walk. And that's all again happening in about, the whole thing in about half a second, um, which is walking speed. Yeah. 
Let's see. Um, I have looked into people who are face blind, prosopagnosia. It, I actually, I'm very mildly face blind, which people for some reason think is funny. It's a condition. I mean, everything's on a bell curve. So is your ability to perceive faces. At its very most extreme, there are people who can't reliably recognize anybody. You know, you can marry somebody and every day they have to say, I'm your wife, because you can't recognize them by face. That is almost always caused by some kind of brain injury, you know, a car accident or something will cause that. We don't really see that in the norm. But there are also people who are super recognizers. Um, I saw a video with a guy, he went down to Town Lake. And he just stood there as people were jogging by. And for the next 100 people, and they were agreeing to do this, he would stop and go, hi. And they would say, you know, my name is Carol. He'd go, hi, Carol, good to meet you. And then they would run. And then he stayed there. And remember, the lake has two different lengths. So people run at different speeds. People are going different lengths. So they would all come back at a different time, completely out of order. Every single person, all 100 of them, he was able to greet by name as they came back to the space. That's very unusual, um, but there's actually in the UK, the police force hire super recognizers and they use them to do human face recognition on data sets because again, they're way better at it. Um, a, a, real, a super recognizer will even outperform an algorithm. Algorithms outperform you know, average vision. And so they actually hire them. If you are in the UK and you're a super recognizer, there's a job there for you if you want. Well, thank you very much, Mary. This has been great. And I think everyone's enjoying this discussion later on the end part here. So thank you for Excellent. doing this. Absolutely. You, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> Mary, and appreciate we'll, it very much. Next time we get Absolutely. around to the happy hours and y'all are in town, we'll try to get everybody together to continue more of these discussions. It's really fascinating with the biometrics. It's fascinating and scary at the same time, but it's good. <laughs> yeah, no, and I'm happy to do it. My email is mary at blinkidentity.com. If you have questions or comments, just feel free because I always enjoy that. Oh, I just saw that I'm losing a lot of weight. Um, actually, my co-founder lost 60 pounds. He started running. We match on both templates. You know, it, it isn't a problem at all. Um, if you're younger, if you have like plastic surgery, you probably need to re-enroll because the template and your face has to be distorted pretty significantly. It would have to be like a car wreck, plastic surgery. Um, normal aging really isn't significant unless you're really crossing a lot of time. We rec uh, recommend that people enroll every year just because eventually if I enrolled at 18 at 60, yeah, I'm probably not going to match anymore. And we don't know exactly where that number is. Also helps the algorithm to do that because then you have the age variations of the same person. So I'll yep. strain it a little bit more. Anyways, all right. Thank you all everybody and see you all next month. Thanks Thank everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hi, everyone.